So listen, I'm sure you know that Oregon is the most exciting wine region in the United States, but I'll bet you didn't know that you can easily become an owner of one of Oregon's leading wineries, Willamette Valley Vineyards. That's right. Willamette Valley Vineyards is a publicly traded stock and you can buy a piece of it. Check it out. It's on NASDAQ at WVVIP. Preferred stock is offered at $5.15 per share with a 4.27% annual dividend. As an owner, you'll receive a 25% discount on wine, an annual wine credit, and other fantastic benefits. That's so cool. Learn more at WVV.com. That's WVV as in Willamette Valley Vineyards.com. Or call the winery at 503-588-9463. Thanks so much, Willamette Valley Vineyards. And now it's time for the show. Hang on. The solar panel looks over to the wind turbine and says, so what do you think about this whole renewable energy thing? And the wind turbine says, I'm a big fan. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, you could let us get away with that. Was good though. That, that was, was a good one. I might use that one again. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Four Top. It's a roundtable discussion of today's hot button topics in the wine and food world. I am your host, Catherine Cole. Joined by co-host Martin Reyes, a master of wine, international wine consultant, winemaker, importer, and educator. Hey, Martin, what are we going to talk about today? Catherine, today, the subject is something I'm very passionate about. I've got a smile on my face because I've been waiting for this one. Uh, sustainability. But hang on. Hang on, everybody. Don't turn the dial. This is a fantastic conversation that will surprise a lot of our listeners. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a couple of projects uh, around the sustainability in wine right now. And what I found is through my own research, there's a lot of misconceptions about what sustainability really means. Oh, I can't wait for this. And I have a sense that just about everyone except our guests and you, Martine, is wrong about sustainability and you all are going to set us right. So I can't wait. So let's meet our expert panelists. We are delighted to be joined by Sandra Taylor, CEO of Sustainable Business International and author of the book, The Business of Sustainable Wine. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you. And Anna Britton, Executive Director at Napa Green. Hello, Anna. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Well, let's start right off by blowing up some sustainability misconceptions for consumers as well as for wine industry insiders. Uh, Martine, the term sustainable gets thrown around all the time, but I have a feeling that most of us are using it incorrectly. So maybe let's start out. Can you just tell us what sustainability really means and what are some common misconceptions about it? All it is is sustainability at its core is, is intended to be defined as meaning our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in addition, so we're talking, we're talking about natural resources. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, land and vineyard and nature. Um, the other misconception is that most people, when they think about that term, they think, okay, it's green, it's environment, it's forests, it's bees, it's reducing your carbon footprint, you know, all that stuff. But there's so much more than that. It's not just environmental. There's a growing awareness that it's there is a holistic understanding of what the term sustainability means, both generally and within wine as well. Um, I think you you shared one of the most kind of common definitions. The other the other really key piece to emphasize, kind of the most basic way we describe sustainability, is it's about people, planet, and prosperity. So it's about caring for the health of nature, but it's also about caring for the health and resilience of employees and community and caring for the health and resilience of businesses. So it really is this broader, more multifaceted umbrella. And there's still a lot of misconceptions that it's just about that environmental stewardship piece, as you were saying. But I think now more than ever, our attention has been drawn to the critical importance of social equity and that we really can't have environmental or economic sustainability without social sustainability. So I really want to emphasize, too, that that's a big part of what we're doing. 
what you uh, mentioned is kind of the globally accepted definition of sustainability. It was really used, though, in the context of sustainable development. So I don't want to, you know, overcomplicate it, but it was really about how can we help the developing world, uh, you know, achieve their own prosperity in a way that is, you know, sustainable. Um, So I frequently say that I hate the term, (laughs) but we're stuck with it, you know, because it can mean so many different things. Um, But you're right. Typically, when we use the term, we we think of avoiding the depletion of natural resources and protecting the natural environment. But as Anna said, it's much more than that. I mean, we need to protect our social resources and our economic resources. So I kind of have, I've come up with my own definition. I prefer to say that sustainability is the integration of environmental health, social equity, and economic vitality in order to create a thriving, healthy, diverse, and resilient resilient communities for this generation and generations to come. I mean, that's long, but it sort of, it it captures the economic uh, viability, the social responsibility, and the fact that we need to do this, all of this, both environmentally and in terms of social equity for many generations to come. I want to ring a little bell, my misconception bell, because you just you just got me with one of my misconceptions, Sandra. I I never thought of economic viability as being part of the sustainability equation. I just always assumed that businesses had to be sustainable to show that they were good human beings. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, that's of course. I mean, social responsibility. I think we've always thought of that as something that you know companies or business should do because it's the right thing to do. But for me, it it has to be economically viable. I mean, I want it to be economically viable because that's the incentive for businesses to engage in the kind of practices we're describing that we're going to talk a little bit more about today. So both environmental protection, social equity, uh, both of those things, I want those to be to deliver returns to business so that uh, so that business from an economic perspective perspective is sustainable. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so I think it's all of those. It's environmental, it's social, and it's, it's uh, economic. Hmm. You know, altruism only gets you so far. I mean, you know, it can only be nice for so long, but you can't cash, you can't pay your mortgage with it, right? You can't cash, you can't build a business on that. We have to continue to thrive and prosper. And that is fundamental to the definition For those of you who don't know, Napa Green is a sustainability certification program for wineries and vineyards in the Napa Valley and Napa County in California. And we have about 90 certified sustainable wineries. Um, And we come in, when we come in to do certification with those wineries, a lot of them think we're just showing up and we're going to say, oh, you got to spend a whole bunch of money on this new technology, whatever it may be. When in fact, we're really actually focused on helping these businesses cut their bottom line in particular by improving their energy efficiency. It's not super sexy, but we audit their energy, water, and waste, and we look at where they're starting from and and where they have areas for improvement. And we've helped our members uh, save more than a million dollars in their electricity costs over the past five years, and we've identified another million dollars in energy rebate and rate savings opportunities for our members. So That piece, that economic piece is really key now more than ever, especially with how our industry has been impacted by COVID and here regionally by the fires as well. Wow. You know, that's so true. And as a matter of fact, you you bring up a point that I I was going to bring up a little later, but this is perfect timing where where the the, the concept of, well, when we think of organic produce or organic wine, organically produced wine, at least nowadays, maybe that change in the past with organic wines getting a bad rap, but now organic foods, let's put it there, tend to be more expensive, right? They, they're viewed as this luxury. That, that may be true, right? And that may be true for even organically grown uh, grapes with, uh, with more labor and, you know, a specific type of use of inputs and outputs around pesticides or herbicides, all that kind of stuff that we don't want to get into now. But it is, it is a fallacy to extend that to the idea that sustainable wines fall into a a luxury category that, like you said, Anna, you're reducing costs, you're reducing inputs. And so there's more affordability. And there's also with less expensive wines, 
there's a, a larger volume of wines made in the you know sub fifteen, sub ten dollar category, right? Oceans of them. If they decide to implement sustainable practices, there's a much greater impact, right? Yeah, I, I, this is Sandra. I think that um, in the past, maybe when businesses in general um, adopt sustainable practices, there is a you know a, a cost to kind of the change over. Right. But honestly, it over time it is basic economics, right? Supply, demand, um, and you know suppliers. I mean, I think increasingly in the wine industry, you know, suppliers also have figured out for inputs have figured out how to pr- provide those in a more sustainable, more cost-effective way. And that's just simple economics. So over time, I think the costs do go down for uh, engaging in sustainable uh, manufacturing, sustainable production of wine or any many other types of products. Um, but, you know, the uh, other important aspect of this, speaking of economics, is the consumer. I mean, the consumer is demanding Um, this kind of product. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about millennials and we know that millennials have an expectation of sustainability in the products that they buy and consumer products, especially because they're perceived to be focused on consumer health and consumer personal well-being. So I think those, all of those pressures will drive the continue to drive the costs of these products down. And there are some great examples. Look at Fetzer. They've been sustainable and engaged in sustainable practices for decades, but many of their wines are $10, $9, $12. So I, I so I think they're a great example and we could learn from how they've managed to do that. Sandra, a really good point. And I, I wanted to ring my misconception bell back there because <laughs> I, I, even I, with a background in wine journalism, always kind of thought, oh, the more sustainable brands are the higher end brands. But that's not always true. You're, you're absolutely correct. Catherine, thanks for being honest about this because you know, <laughs> all of us have learning curves. I, you know, we've all been there, even Anna and Sandra, who are steeped in this when they first get in the business or rather get in the topic. You know, you learn and you're just like, oh, it's not that it's this and it's not that it's that. Right. And, and same, same with me too. And, and this brings up something and I want to bring you back in because, uh, you know, a lot of industry insiders in, in the wine trade, um, they, they have said privately or, or sometimes publicly that most certifications, right. Most sustainable certifications don't mean Jack. Well, let me tell you, you could talk to some of our members and they would say they wish it's a lot easier than it is to get certification. It's actually, we set a very high bar. This is this is no easy uh, greenwashing certification that we're doing. I mean, our, our winery members have to implement more than 120 different practices to improve energy and water efficiency and reduce waste and take climate action and ensure social equity and caring, and caring for their employees and community Um, And all of that, it's very important to note, all of that is third party validated. And I think this is where certifications are so key, that there is actually someone coming out and validating that folks are walking the talk. They're not just saying that they're, you know, using less energy and water. That's actually being validated. They're not just saying that they're purchasing um, better environmentally preferable products or not using styrofoam or not handing out plastic bottled water. It's actually being validated that they're doing all of those things. One of the main questions we get, I mean, top three <laughs> always is sustainable. Oh, you mean organic or sustainable? How is that different from organic? Or organic is, you know, the real teeth. Organic's the most meaningful thing you can do. And so this is one I just have to jump in there and address. Organic is is great, but organic is, here's how I describe the difference. Organic is for the farm specifically. It's not related to any stewardship practices in the winery. And it's about what you don't want to do. Don't use synthetic pesticides. Um, It's a pretty clear story. Um, Whereas the sustainability is from the vineyard into the winery in 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 case of the wine sector that I work in. Um, And it's it's about the things you do want to do. So it's also about that resource efficiency and it's about climate action and it's about social equity. And none of those things are things that are the focus of organic farming. So sustainability is actually a much bigger umbrella. We're actually trying to do a lot more. It's a more complicated story, certainly, um, because it isn't as straightforward as don't use synthetic pesticides, which is a piece of this, definitely. We're very focused on reducing the use 
of, of pesticides and herbicides, but there's so much more that we're trying to work with our members to do. And that's not even speaking to the vineyard side of things yet. I think it's instructive for the listener to say, okay, organic and biodynamic. Those are farming practices, like you said. Sustainability, the deeper sense of sustainability and the practice of sustainability comes from an entire mindset. It's an actual mindset where the mindset informs every decision in your vineyard or your business or your or your bottling line or the way in which you treat your, your employees, the way in which you are a, a steward of your land and the way you are a neighbor to your community, right? It, the mindset informs that. So it's not just farming. It is a, a full mindset. Do you, do you, tell me how you would push back or if you would agree with that. Well, I would say, I wouldn't say mindset. I think it's looking at the entire supply chain Mm -hmm. Uh, from farming through to delivery of the bottle on the shelf and what are the environmental and social issues, labor, you know, social equity community, what are the, the, all of those sustainability issues going back to our definition or my definition of sustainability? Uh, what are all the sustainability issues that are, are part of the entire supply chain. So it's not so much a mindset because I think these certifications are rigorous and they're very specific. Mm -hmm. Here is what you are expected to do in order to be certified under Napa Green or Sustainable Wine New Zealand or any number of sustainability certifications that exist in the wine uh, sector around the world. So it's, it's uh, but I think that the certification tries or does um, capture and involve every aspect of the supply chain. So not so much a mindset. Yeah. Can I um, a ring my misconception bell again, and then ask you both, ask you all to help us a little bit out? First mm -hmm. of all, um, my misconception bell is you know I also work in branding and design for wineries, and when we work on websites, we go through and we say, okay, well, let's talk about your farming style and your your vineyard, and oh, we farm organically and. And that's all they talk about on their, they don't talk about any other form of sustainability on their website. So why Thank aren't you for noting yes. that? <laughs> yeah. Why aren't they saying we use recycled cardboard and we, you know, recycle our, our water in our winery and we, you know, use solar energy. So that's, that's my misconception bell that I, I realize I need to help out with that in my everyday work. And then my question, Sandra, can you quickly um, describe what you're talking about when you talk about the supply chain for our listeners who may not know what you're referring to? Yeah. So it's, it's from the beginning <laughs> from, you know, the, the vine, the grapes, um, you know, who's tending the vines, what, you know, so that's part of the supply chain that's labor. They're supplying their labor, um, all the way through to manufacturing, what goes into the, you know, wine making, what goes into bottling uh, or other packaging, because that's important too, when we talk about sustainability. Um, so I think all of the, when I talk about supply chain, it's from the beginning of a product to the end of life of a product. Um, so it's, you know, it's the, the grapes and the fermentation, the harvesting, the fermentation of the grapes, and then, um, the actual, all, all of the magic that the winemaker, um, brings to the wine and then bottling, uh, labeling, uh, shipping, a uh, distribution, and having that bottle on the shelf, all of that is part of the supply chain. So mm -hmm. every input, um, you know, labor, but also material, you talk about the, you know, the, the paper that's used in the label, all of those things. When I talk about supply chain, that's what I, I talk about. Some people call it value chain. I like to talk about it as supply chain. And those big styrofoam shipping inserts. I don't know if, if listeners, if you've ordered wine to have be delivered, it, it drives me crazy, all the styrofoam that's used. Yeah. Yeah. So one of our Napa Green requirements is that you do not use styrofoam. And we've actually heard so much positive feedback <laughs> from the Catherines of the world, from wine club members, actually saying, thank you so much for the fact that you're no longer sending this to me in styrofoam. I don't think people know, but styrofoam ne basically never goes away. I mean, it's in the environment for a thousand years. It's not, mm. it's not recyclable. 
I think another example of the supply chain that's kind of a hot topic right now is, is the bottles themselves. So for mm-hmm. anyone that's kind of interested in, in the carbon footprint and, and climate action in the wine industry, packaging and distribution is often anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of a winery's carbon footprint. And somewhere along the way, these really heavy bottles got mistakenly associated with better wine. Mm-hmm. And we're still having to fight back away from that. But it is a really hot topic right now is lightening up those bottles and, and the degree to which that reduces costs. It reduces it, it actually increases how much wine you can put in a shipment. So that reduces costs and that greatly reduces the carbon footprint of those shipments. We have one of our member wineries that just changed their packaging and they were able to reduce their shipments to New York from five shipments to two. So think about those kinds of cost savings um, mm-hmm. just in something we might not so think about when we're popping the cork, but the weight of that bottle and, and what that means in terms of getting it into your hand. You know, to crystallize this idea of the glass, to put this in um, shocking terms, the, the glass is, I, I did, uh, I did a, a while back a, a session on uh, how to glass reduces carbon footprint for a, a wine organization. Uh, international one. And when I did a little bit of digging, I realized, wait, hold on, wait a minute. A, gla- a, a case of wine, most wine comes in glass, of course, that's changing, thankfully. A case of wine is around 40 pounds, roughly. You know how much of that is the wine? <laughs> ha- about half of it. Mm-hmm. The other half, 20 pounds, roughly, roughly speaking, is the cardboard and the glass, right? Shocking, because half of the packaging of the weight. Now, there's a lot of reasons why glass is being used, a lot of positive reasons, a lot, which we don't have to get into now, but it is a perfect medium for many reasons. But then it's also heavy, and um, it, it, and, and it, yes, it can be recycled. But even the recycling system in the U.S. is broken, right? Mm-hmm. To put it yeah. bluntly, yeah. so we can we can do a lot more than that. There and there are things that are being discussed and and research being done around the, uh, return and reuse schemes for uh for wines and actually frankly anna is is uh with when that i know that there is an involvement with that as well and that's the sort of the holy grail of being able to reuse your packaging the the circular economy which is becoming the is becoming the buzzword in other parts of the world outside of wine uh, it's creeping into the wine industry don't you think anna I think it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's one of those buzzwords, right? So that's like, the, like cradle to grave. So it's thinking yeah. about something along its entire life cycle and that idea of being able to get a bottle back to a winery to refill. It's a tough nut to crack, but I, that really is kind of the, the ultimate level we would like to take it to. But that requires so much behavior change all along the way, including the consumers drinking the wine, you know, being willing to take that bottle back to a store for reuse. So, but those, those efforts are underway. Yeah. And and there's really good research that's been done that shows that you don't have to ship wine in very heavy bottles. I mean, there's no safety issues. It doesn't, the, the a lighter bottle doesn't break in shipping. I mean, so I think, you know, that those are some of the arguments that, you know, we heard early on when we, from, distributors and also from producers when we said, oh, you should have lighter bottles. Well, the research shows that lighter bottles are just as safe for shipping wine as uh, or, you know, as safe, let's put it that way, as as the heavier bottles, but a lot less costly. And I love the examples Anna gave of how, uh, you know, wineries are understanding the, the savings that they're getting from uh, lighter weight bottles. And then there are other, you know, there's cans, there's wine and kegs. It's mostly for, it's for wine by the glass service. But when you think about, you know, how much, how often people order wine by the glass, um, I think one keg, and it's like a beer keg. So people, the audience will understand that, but one steel keg holds about the same as 26 bo- wine bottles. So imagine that. So imagine this, it, the elimination of materials, glass bottles, corks, labels, cardboard boxes, all of that that typically would end up in the landfill because, unfortunately, we don't recycle very well in this country. So all of that stuff ends up in the landfill. Uh, and there are a couple of companies that are doing gr- a great job of this where they sh- they b- get the wine from the winery. It's shipped across country or across town uh, to the restaurant. You order your wine by the glass. It's th- it stays fresh down to the very last glass. Uh, so no more going to the restaurant and ordering a glass of wine 
wine that's from a bottle that was opened the previous day. I can always taste the difference. I don't know if everybody, <laughs> if people can, but I can. Um, so it's 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 better for the consumer experience, um, and it's better for the environment. Um, and it's less costly for producers and it's less costly for the, the restaurant or the retailer. You know, this is mostly for restaurants or wine bars because they have less waste. I mean, it's a great I think it was just a great invention. And then, of course, there's cans, um, which is an aluminum and aluminum is um kind of infinitely recyclable. Most alum- I, I think I read a statistic that 75% of, of aluminum that's currently circulating has been circulating for decades. So it's, you know, you, uh, infinitely recyclable. So wine in cans, which is very convenient for the pool, for the beach, you know, for, for games or whatever. So uh, there's so many alternatives, I think, today to the glass uh, bottle for uh, for consumers, um, and it's up to the industry, I think, to help consumers understand that you know none of these packaging alternatives uh, are um, provide less quality in terms of the the wine. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, Sander, because I think it's sort of a chicken or an egg thing, right? It's it's just that the producers don't tend to put high quality wine in cans. It's not that the quality of the wine is worse because it's in a can. It's just that the good quality wine just isn't being canned. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I would say too, like cans and kegs are a great great option for wines that are going to be drunk pretty quickly. You know, I think glass is is here to stay for wines that are aging. It really is the vessel for for aging the wines, but. That isn't to say there aren't a lot more, you know, fine wines that couldn't go into some of these packaging alternatives. Well, I am feeling very lucky today because for our sponsor break, I get to pop a bottle that represents my two favorite styles of wine. This is the Grand Marine Yamhill Carlton Oregon Brut Rosé. It's a blend of 57% Chardonnay and 43% Pinot Noir, vinified in the traditional method, that is the double bottle fermentation that is also practiced in Champagne. Uh, Selected lots of the base wine were aged in neutral French oak barrels for three months to add depth, complexity, and spice to the final blend. This single vineyard estate-grown wine then spent a minimum of 24 months on tirage. Uh, At just five grams per liter of sugar, this wine could actually qualify as an extra brut, which is really my happy place in terms of dosage. If you have no idea what I just said, don't worry about it. It Just just know that it's not a big, fat, sugary, sparkling wine. It's very balanced. It's it's very crisp. It's very delicious. Um, So Rachel and I have been sitting here sipping it, and I'm going to take one more sip. We're both going to take one more sip, and I'm going to ask her what she thinks. What do you think? Hmm, Yum. Um, no, I think this wine tastes like, to me, it tastes like apricots and honey, but like with kind of a pop to it. I mean, I love bubbles anytime, but I drink this wine all day. Me too. Me too. It's delicious. Grand Moraine is a winery that prides itself for unconstrained experimentation, eschewing expectations, and unself-conscious innovation. And you can actually read about this particular Brut Rosé in a certain book called Sparkling Wine Anytime. You may have heard of it. But you're probably wondering how you can get a hold of a bottle of these delicious bubbles. The best way to do it is to make an appointment to visit Grand Moraine in Oregon's Willamette Valley, where you can see the open air winemaking facility and vineyard and taste through the wines at a leisurely pace. Or have Grand Moraine delivered to your home with free shipping. Yes, free shipping if you use the promo code FORTOP. That's F O U R T O P. So go to grandmarine.com to purchase your wine online, enter that promo code for top and shipping is on the house. Thank you so much, Grand Marine. Loving these bubbles. I wanted to go back, Catherine, to something you, you touched on, but we didn't dive into, which is telling your sustainability story and how often you kind of see these same stories getting told time and again. There is this very you know, common sort of pastoral story that's painted of especially of sustainability in the wine industry and this focus on the vineyard, which we've been talking about and and less on the winery side. And I think it really is time for a kind of shakeup in, in telling these stories and, and the fact that consumers really do want to hear these stories. When you tell someone you were able, one of our members 
found out they needed to cut their water use and they started working with their staff and they asked them for their ideas and they gave them updates on their progress. And in two years, they were able to cut their water use by 25%. And when they share that story in the tasting room, and you know why they're sharing it in the tasting room? Because the logos are on the bottle, which causes people to ask the question, what is that? What's the snap of green thing? What does that mean? What are you guys doing? And then when they can say, oh, well, one of the things we did was we cut our water use 25%. People love that. That resonates. I've seen some wineries put cards into their packaging saying this is made with 75% recycled packaging. And they get calls from their wine club members saying, I love this, you know, share more about what you're doing. It, it makes them feel good. And, and it's not something they have to put much effort into other than ordering and drinking that wine, right? So we need to share that, share that story more widely. And, you know, and for those of us who have been, you know, working in sustainability for many years, it's exciting that consumers, the, you know, the, the wine club member is aware of, of water stressed areas. They maybe they live in an area that's water stressed. Maybe they never understood a lot of this, you know, environmental mumbo jumbo, but now mm -hmm. they understand what's happening. They, they see, you know, TV shows and documentaries about plastic and about, you know, a lot of things that never seemed uh, that to, to touch them personally, but now they, they understand that and they like it when, you know, their winery that they, or the, the wine club um, is aligned with, you know, their thinking or helps them um, with some of their concerns about the environment. You know, what also reinforces all this sadly is the fact that we are seeing the effects of the climate mm -hmm. changing right yeah now all yeah. of us are from water shortages to fires to 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 hazards uh that are the extremes in in, in all places much like i mean just so much up there if you want to watch the great uh, uh movie on netflix called breaking boundaries and it's it's narrated by none other than david attenborough <laughs> yeah himself. and it, and they say like you know pandemics don't occur in resilient or in healthy ecosystems, mm -hmm. right? If we think of the visual of greenwashing, and then you just hose, hose it off with, with water and it comes off. No, I think that there is a, 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 a distinct chapter in our evolution, specifically in wine, where the green is seeping in to the surface. It's not just surface deep anymore. It's actually getting into the pores of whatever it is that, that we're discussing. Hold on. Someone needs to define the term greenwashing. Yeah, I get so irritated when people tell me they're sustainable, when, but they're really not. They're not really walking the talk. Right. Um, so, I mean, greenwashing is where it's it's often, unfortunately, marketers, marketing people are often more guilty of this than than anybody where if a, if an organization has a couple of environmental practices, they blow them up to be bigger than they are. I have one, one example that really irritate. There was a winery, this was in Bordeaux in France and a, a, a winery owner said to me, Oh, we're sustainable because there's a rare butterfly that lives in our vineyard. And it wouldn't be there if we weren't sustainable. And so I said, basically, please don't repeat that to anybody because it, it doesn't mean anything. So greenwashing, really, it's just, you know, it's uh, it's it's lying, really. Um, there is some great uh, websites about, you know, greenwashing lies. Um, but people talk about the fact that they are environmentally responsible when they're not, or, or they use one practice to say their entire operation is environmentally sustainable. And that's really, you know, it's like brainwashing only green, meaning environmental washing. I'll share a grounded example of that. I think this was especially true, you know, years ago, early 2000s. A lot of businesses would just install solar, and certainly that's an investment, um, but it doesn't involve any broader culture change or any broader resource savings. It's it's just kind of a, if you got the money, it's an easy button to push, right? And then they would say, we're so sustainable. Um, and again, it's just, it's one practice and it's one environmental stewardship practice, but it's not thinking about those broader social equity and, and economic factors as well. Hey, no one's naming names. I want to get snarky here. <laughs> so, okay, I'll give you an example of something that uh, so Jances Robinson is a is a is a well known wine critic, uh, and she uh, and she's based in London, uh, also a master of wine, and she uh, has started to call out 
when she when they critique wines on quality, it used to be just sort of a, a vacuum. Like, how good is this wine quality? Up or down? Yes or no? I like. Here's a point system. Whatever. Right. Uh, she is. She has started to, and her writers are starting to call out when they weigh the bottles, and they're or this or the size of the heaviness of the bottles, mm-hmm. and they actually call out by name the wineries and say, uh, your, "Your wine was lovely. It's a Sancerre from so and so." And by the way, your bottles suck. Change them. Horrid examples. You should definitely <laughs> back the f off. Of course, <laughs> back off the, the the density of your glass because this is this is horrible. And the wine, some more wineries have responded. So there is there is a bit of that that shaming going on um, uh, in certain parts of the industry. Yeah, I, I, and I recall hearing that a, a French champagne producer uh, was increasing the weight of the bottle of the champagne that they would ship to China because of this perception of you know higher quality, heavier bottle, higher quality. Um, and and I understand that, but you know, are they committed to sustainability or not? You know, and. Um, I think it was Moet Hennessy, actually. Mm-hmm. And they've got a great you know, record, but in that particular case, they just couldn't resist doing that. And as far as I'm concerned, a lot of other things that they say they're doing um, would be a little bit suspect. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's, it's, if you think about like a single term, single use plastic, right, and how bad that is, if you want to reuse that, right? Wine right now is bottled in single use glass. Yep. Other things out there that are higher quality are uh, are packaged in something heavier come on you kidding me like lightness is what i mean the laptop is light it means it's more luxurious if it's light right Mm -hmm. your 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 uh, bicycle is lighter the the top end ones are all you know weight isn't an asset except for some reason right we've been told and we've come to believe collectively that heavy glass means the wine is better bullshit (laughs) <laughs> right. let's, let's, right. and let's make it let's make heavier bottles not sexy anymore let's make lighter bottles freaking sexy yeah well, and there's this misconception that you could even tell the difference right you can make such small changes to the bottle and its weight that are right. imperceptible years ago i was consulting with benziger family wines talking to the family about lightening the bottle because they wanted to reduce their carbon footprint. And they're like, no, 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 no. The customer will notice. They'll think it's a lower quality wine. And we brought in a lineup of the bottles, you know, a few of which had just had some weight shaved off the corn, the shoulders of the bottle or off the punt of the bottle and lined them up next to the traditional bottles. And they picked them up and looked them all over and they could not tell the difference. They couldn't tell the difference. And that was totally eye-opening to them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be this really dramatic change. Right. Um, it can still be very elegant, even imperceptible, and make a big difference. Yeah, and reduce costs. Yeah. And you don't even have to tell the consumer. I mean, one of my concerns is that too often when we talk about sustainability, it sounds really negative. You know, it's it's bad. It's not, you know, the, it's not going to taste as well. It's going to be, you know, maybe the bottle isn't as safe and the paper isn't as, as elegant. I mean, I think we need to start to talk about sustainability in a much more positive way and talk both within the industry and externally to consumers. You know, let's, let's share all the good things that are, we've been talking about some of the great stories that, that are the result of sustainable practices. And I think we need to talk about them uh, so that it's not doom and gloom. I mean, climate is really, it's starting to become very oppressive, right? But we, you know, we've got to figure out a way that we can talk about the fact, the way, the ways in which we are addressing some climate issues are very positive. And so that's a challenge for the marketers out there to start talking more positively about this stuff. One of my lines is that sustainability is elevating the quality and luxury of Napa Valley wines. So on that note of positive, it really is. This our Napa Green members, it's really elevating the experience here. And we we have to share that more and more. Mm-hmm. Speaking of positive experience, I want to bring in the subject about uh, carbon sequestration and regenerative farming. Anna, could you talk a little bit about that and define those terms and why that's so cool? Yeah, those are really, really hot topics right now. So I really want to help everyone sort of understand what we mean when we're talking about that. And to your earlier comment, Martine, about um, kind of the rigor and and how meaningful um, these certifications are, 
first, it's it's just important to stress that all things grow and evolve, right? And, and a big part of sustainability is continuing and improvement. And so on that note, we have just recently completely redeveloped our Napa Green Vineyard certification standards to focus on, you know, the issues of now and the future, two of the most critical issues, which are climate action and social equity. Um, so we've designed a kind of six-part certification all of the pieces um, are related to climate action and social equity. But in particular, very core to it is what's called carbon farming and regenerative agriculture. And I think we're all hearing those terms more and more. What exactly do those mean? So I thought I would actually paint a sort of picture of what that means. So imagine that you're standing in the middle of a vineyard in this really rich soil. You're looking all around you at these vines. There are these beautiful cover crops on the ground, and those are serving so many purposes. Those are attracting beneficial insects that fight off the bad ones that we don't want there. They're actually helping to store more nutrients in the soil and keep more water in the soil, and they're actually storing more carbon in the soil. Similarly, there's a compost spread through the vineyard, and in the same way, that's adding to that water retention and to the health of the soil, but it's also storing more carbon in the soil. And along the side of the vineyard, there's a hedgerow, there's beautiful trees and bushes, and those are providing habitat for bees and butterflies, but they're also storing this carbon in the soil. And over on the side, there's an electric tractor, and that's using less energy. It's doing fewer passes in the vineyard, and so that's storing more carbon in the soil. And so there are all these ways, actually, that farmers and, and winemakers can actually play this really um, truly meaningful role in drawing down carbon and storing more carbon in the soil. And that's what we mean when we talk about regenerative. It's about these practices that really increase the health of the soil and of the vines and of the biodiversity of the of the ecosystem, but they also actually store this carbon in the soil and have a meaningful mitigation impact. So interesting. I didn't hear the word organic or biodynamic in there. I think, <laughs> again, the, my misconceptions are falling away. This is fascinating. I want to um, have a, a closing thought. As I was listening to Anna right now, and frankly, as I was listening to Sandra turning things into a positive and Anna saying, look, there is this huge movement of regenerative farming and there are certific certifications around that too that are coming out. The regenerative farming and that carbon sink into the soil can actually turn the wine industry into a, a positive actor, not just a, a drawer of carbon, not just a, a, a polluter, not just a wasteful uh, part of the waste system, but through choices like return, reuse bottles, like kegs, like re re recycling elements, like cans and, and, and uh, reducing water uses or even dry farming and the regenerative farming itself. The idea that we can actually sequester and pull out carbon from the environment um, and be a, a problem solver, not a problem creator. We're, we're, we're really well poised to turn this love of our land and love of our wine into a positive thing if we have the right education if we continue to to share the stories that uh that our listeners are are uh, being exposed to if we also re-emphasize that the quality is there and that it just becomes more affordable there's all these like mo how many more check boxes do we need yeah to say hey all these reasons so much so much um optimism that i see on multiple levels that I, 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 I'm sure Anna and, and Sandra would, would, could, could think about that too. Absolutely. I mean, I'm very encouraged. I think the wine industry, I mean, sometimes I talk about the, the wine industry as a victim of climate change. I mean, it, compared to other industries and human, other human contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know, we're relatively small, the wine industry, but we yeah. can be a great example and a great leader and, and of course, help to save, you know, our own selves, our industry. Um, but uh, I think that's all very, very positive. And I'm, I'm excited about that, frankly. Me too. Yeah, we make the premier agricultural product. So the leadership that we take ha makes waves. You know, it, it gets it it gets it influences the broader beverage sector and the broader marketplace. And that's mm -hmm. why it's fun to be part of this. It's sexy and it's meaningful. Yeah.
And, and it's tied in the mind of consumers is tied to the soil and to a picturesque, like the, that sort of agro turismo, right? The, 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 who, do we go visit our, maybe eventually, do we go visit our, um, you know, our coffee plantations mm-hmm. or other, no, no, there's this, there's, there's yeah. this idyllic mental eucolic essence that the wine industry uh, ev- evokes in the, in our, in the general public that we can also, we could just take advantage of that too, because there's so much good there. You know? Absolutely. I mean, nobody talks about, you know, the corn farmer or the wheat farmer or, you know, any of those things. But people, even people who are not very, very knowledgeable about wine like to talk about, here's a wine I'm going to bring for dinner and here's what I've learned about it. They love that. And, and the people that they share those stories with love it too. So we have such an opportunity to be um, a leader in helping educate consumers about a lot of these um, sustainability um, challenges as well. Oh, I love all this positivity. This is a wonderful note to wrap this episode up on. I think it's time for our dessert wine course. Did you all bring a dessert wine course for us? Sandra, you look like you're ready. You've got something. I did. I did. So and I love the idea of the dessert wine I uh, or dessert. It's not a wine. I wanted <laughs> to... Um, mention um a show a docuseries that's um that you can find on netflix it's called high on the hog um it's um i like it i mean i have to admit that the the it's based on the book by jessica harris uh who's a culinary expert who happens to be a friend of mine uh, and she's a beard james beard award um winner um so uh, her book was made into a docuseries about uh, african-american um cuisine a uh, great uh narrator um stephen satterfield who's actually a sommelier and i kept wanting him to talk about what wines would pair with you know these foods that's not what the show is about We've got Stephen on another episode, so people can hear him as well. So, oh, he, good, yeah, oh, good. He, yeah. It's it's really it's beautifully done. It's very well produced. Great photography. Um, don't watch it when you're hungry, though, because it's the food <laughs> is really really. But it's it's all about how you know kind of a- Africa influenced the foods of America, of the Caribbean, of Brazil, and they they interview several chefs and they they eat some great food in in the show. (laughs) Fabulous. Fabulous. How about you, Anna? Well, sacrilege. I'm going to talk about an amazing wine I recently had that wasn't from the Napa Valley. So hopefully not too many Napa Valley people. That's not allowed. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I want to (laughs) know. What is it? I was so lucky. I got to go wine tasting over on the Sonoma coast at, at a winery called Halleck. I'm a big Pinot Noir girl. Um, and they have an estate Pinot over there. He was describing they planted this little vineyard. It's right by their house. He said they did everything wrong they could have done. It's like six different rootstocks and all, you know, just it, it was a bit of insanity. And yet I think that one of their first vintages, they won like several best Pinot awards. Mm-hmm. And I just have to say I was trying this. It just had all this like herbal eucalyptus. It was just so potent. And I thought it was honestly, one of the best Pinots I've ever had. So I am giving a shout out to a, a Sonoma County winemaker because it was really special to, to try that wine. Mm-hmm. And can you repeat the name of that winery? It's ha- I think it's Halleck Vineyards, H-A-L-L-E-C-K. Oh, I'll have Great. to check it out. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Martin, what did you bring for dessert wine? You know, for my, my I'm thinking about uh, ways to... Um, reduce waste in my uh, fridge if we have a little bit too much uh we, we buy a lot of squash uh <laughs> in my in my household sometimes and we love it but sometimes it's about to get uh you know a little extra so i i actually just threw in um I, you grate it with uh you know the cheese grater uh and then you throw in a bunch of uh Parmigiano reggiano cheese a little bit of egg there and you're able to make these fantastic uh, uh veggie uh, you know, squash fritters. And what's the kicker for that is if you have kids at home, that's the way, way to increase their vegetable intake while it's still mm-hmm. yummy, a little dash of salt, a dash of pepper, maybe a little hot sauce. My, my, uh, my little, uh, almost three-year-old is, uh, uh, is a big fan of, of hot sauce, habanero sauce, mm-hmm. and he downs this stuff. And so uh, I, I like finding ways to come up with 
simple, uh, quick way, uh, you know, quick recipes to, th- to take food from that's otherwise going to go into your, um, into your garbage can and then produce methane, which is worse than carbon dioxide mm-hmm. in landfills. <laughs> Now I'm hungry and thirsty. Me yeah. too. <laughs> oh, and that would be good with some Chardonnay, I think. Yum, yum, sure yum. Sure would. Mm-hmm. It would. Well, okay, for my dessert, I'm sorry. I, I feel like I'm even going to get in trouble for this, but I was thinking that some of our listeners might want an example of greenwashing. <laughs> so I'm going to name I'm going to name a name and I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, <laughs> when I was researching this episode, I came across this article in Wine Spectator, it said Reese Vineyards, it's R-H-Y-S. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, it's Reese. Um, mm-hmm. To pay $3.76 million for damage to Mendocino watershed. They were faulted for filling a stream with dirt, bulldozing <clears throat> a protected wetland, basically destroying habitat for salmon and trout. Anyway, then you go to the Reese Vineyards website and it's beautiful. <laughs> and as a consumer, you look at it and you think, oh, wow, these guys are so green. They're so sustainable. They're just mm-hmm. the websites. There's so many trees and it just looks so lush and, you know, they're celebrating the landscape. So anyway, um, if our listeners are still wondering, you know, what what's an example of a greenwashed wine? <laughs> I, I think that's an example... It's highly, I'm sure that they, that Reese has changed their practices since this came out, this article came out and, and, and this all happened, but, um, it's just an example that don't, don't fall for the marketing, you know, look for that Napa green certification and, uh, make sure that the winery is, is not just presenting a bunch of pretty pictures that represent them as being something that they're not. Thank you so much. Fabulous panelists. You were fantastic. Uh, listeners, you can find Sandra Taylor online at discoversustainablewine.com. And you can find Anna Britton online at napagreen.org. And Martine, remind our listeners where they can find you online. You can find me at uh, reyeswinegroup.com. Uh, lis- listeners, you can also read about Martine on the fortop.org. And you can find me on thefortop.org as well as at katherinecole.com. Um, but please do go to thefortop.org and find our social media feeds and uh, get in touch with us via social media. We really want to hear from you. Please also subscribe to The Four Top on your favorite podcast app. Please leave us a rating if you have time. We'd really like other people to find the pod and that's how they will. Signing out here from the high fiber protein pack city of Portland, Oregon. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you. Fantastic panelists. This was a really, this is a lovely conversation. Bye-bye. This has been the Four Top Podcast. Catherine Cole is our executive producer. Izzy Kramer is our senior producer. And I'm Keelan King, sound supervisor. We are also assisted by audio editor, Michelle Richards, our production assistant, Rachel Grossman, and our social media assistants, Lex Rule and Nick Toole. Please visit our website, thefortop.org, to learn more about us, listen to back episodes, reach out to us on social media, and purchase books written by our amazing panelists. And if you have not already subscribed to The Four Top on iTunes, NPR One, or Spotify, please do so and leave us a rating. Stay safe out there, and thanks for listening. wait a minute. Are, are you still there? Oh, well, if you're still listening, then I need to tell you something. I need to tell you about the fabulous swag over at sparklingwineanytime.com. Sparkling Wine Anytime is, of course, your favorite new book about all things bubbly, but it is also a wonderful website designed by our team, Lex and Rachel, And we have gifts and goodies galore for you. We have sparkling wine themed beach towels, teas, cocktail napkins, fancy wine flasks, adorable tote bags, and more. And guess what? Your purchase will help to support a favorite cause of ours, Aivoy, that's A-H-I-V-O-Y, check it out, which provides education and career training to vineyard stewards in the Willamette Valley. So it's a win-win for everyone. And who doesn't love sparkling wine anytime? Please head to sparklingwineanytime.com we would love to see you there. Thanks. We love you all. You're wonderful. Kiss, kiss.